<clears throat> we are right at about um, five minutes after seven. We'll go ahead and get started. So again, thanks to everybody who is uh, joining and listening in and those who may not be with us right now live, but you're listening to this via playback. Uh, thank you all for just taking the opportunity. Um, I believe that this evening is really a conversation that is definitely much needed um, uh, due to our current state of affairs. So um, we are blessed tonight to have three individuals who are um, the elite in their subject area of expertise, which is mental health. Um, so before we get started, I'm gonna give each, each of them an opportunity just to introduce themselves. So feel free to tell a little bit about your background, um, a little bit about you for anyone who is listening so they may get to know a little bit about you. So um, Sylvia, we can start with you. Okay, good evening. Um, Sylvia Jessup, First, let me just say, um, Dr. Johnson, I just think this is such an important topic. Amen. And one of the things that we have to thank you for is being on the forefront of just saying, we need to get this out there. Amen. So first, thanks to you and New Zion. Amen. Thank you. So I'm a licensed um, mental health counselor and also a licensed marriage and family therapist. I graduated from Gordon-Conwell after having spent 31 years in corporate America. Hmm. So I quickly, I tell people that at some point I stopped running from what God had called me to do. Uh. <laughs> and when I stopped running, um, I went back to school and this is what I'm doing now. Something that I know is a, a passion for me and a calling on my life. Hmm. Hmm. Amen. Amen. All right. Valerie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so like Sylvia, I was running for a while as well. So uh, my name is Valerie Williams. I'm, I'm a licensed psychotherapist. Uh, similar to Sylvia's experience, I spent a good bit of time in corporate um, about 20 years before transitioning into counseling full time. Um, again, just a situation where I felt like it better aligned with my purpose and my gifts and my calling. So here I am. Um, one disclaimer for the evening. I think most of you on the call <clears throat> may not be um, clergy. I am not clergy. Um, I am just a Christian trying to do life like everyone else. So I just wanted to kind of make that clear given the, the format that, that we're in today. But um, I would just echo Sylvia's sentiments as far as um, just kind of giving you so much credit um, for putting together this forum and allowing a platform for people to talk openly about faith and mental health and just how the two can coexist. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. And I'm just excited and looking forward to the, the dialogue we'll have tonight. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. All right, Dr. Cooper. Well, I just want to follow up again and say thank you as well. This is a, a wonderful opportunity, and the fact that you're doing it uh, says volumes about you, uh, <clears throat> Reverend Johnson, because just of the fact that you're letting us know that you're holistic in your approach. You not only think about the spiritual, but you think about the emotional and, and the uh, all the aspects that go with that. So thank you for making this a key piece. Um, I've been in the ministry as a, uh, I guess you would say a pastor or a minister for golly, well over 40 years. I've uh, been a psychologist for going on uh, 30 or 25 now. Uh, I've been licensed here uh, in, Col I was in Colorado and now I'm here in North Carolina. I've been licensed close to 25 years now. My major, uh, I teach at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and I would say the major areas that I, I work in are one, uh, men's issues in terms of transitions and dealing with particular areas of family and marriage, those kinds of things. And also working in the area of anxiety and, and depression, working in those things as well. Uh, so those are, that's kind of my background. I've been a pastor of family ministries in a church and I also have a part-time practice. And so that's kind of me at this point in time. And i uh, been married 37 years and you know, all I can say is, is that, um, you know, God bless my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, good, good. Well, again, thank you all um, for taking um, an opportunity because I know you're busy uh, doing what you do most evenings. So <clears throat> and thank you all for agreeing to uh, be with us here tonight. So. Um, so now the reason for all of this, I was actually watching something 
um, a couple weeks ago, and it said that due to the COVID-19, um, this whole um, coronavirus that has spread, what they were saying is that the focus has been on physical health, mm -hmm. securing our physical health. But very little attention has been given to mental health. Mm -hmm. um, on one aspect, we're trying to avoid um, or remediate uh, the virus that many people have either uh, captured in their physical body, but those around them um, or, or those who maybe have not been impacted by somebody directly who has it, just from the fact that our society has changed pace, have been impacted mentally and very little attention been given to that. Um, so I want to read a few dis uh, statistics here before we get into our discussion for tonight. So um, statistics say that since the COVID-19 virus has broken out in our global society, 67% of people report higher levels of stress. 57% uh, say they have greater anxiety. 54% say they are more emotionally exhausted. 53% say they feel sadness day to day. 50% say that they feel they are more irritable. And 42% report their overall mental health has declined. So these numbers show that um, a significant amount of our population is struggling mentally uh, with the current state of our affairs. So that's segue into what we're going to be talking about tonight, our mental health. How can we secure? How can we um, um, do whatever necessary uh, to bring a good resolution, a good godly resolution to um, any mental health concerns that are out there? So um, I'll start with you, uh, Sylvia, giving you this first question just for you to answer. So um, this is new territory for everybody. We've never been through anything like this before in our lives. And maybe to this point that uh, someone has felt secure in the way that they think in their mental health, um, but now they could be questioned whether or not they're slipping into depression. Uh, what would you say are some early signs that someone could be slipping into a depressive state? Yeah, um, unfortunately, just with the statistics that you just shared, we know a lot of this is going on. So when people are losing their jobs or losing their sense of community by being able to go out to work or go to their house of worship, mm -hmm. um, it starts to affect who they believe they are. Mm -hmm. And so sitting in the house, just being isolated starts to, it might look like, and it looks different for different people, but it might look like um, lack of self-care, mm -hmm. you know? Um, an inability to get up out of the bed in the morning and get motivated. Um, being irritable, one of the things that you mentioned. Um, being just really short-tempered with the people who are in the house with you. Or even isolation. You know, we're told to shelter in place, but some people are sheltering in place with other people in the house, but it's still isolating. Yeah. So when you see those kind of signs, um, it just may be a sign that depression is trying to slip in. Okay. Okay. Now, um, so a question I have for you, Valerie. Um, so if depression is settling in or if it, if this way of life now is impacting um, anyone emotionally, um, sometimes we talk about distraction. So if there's something that's in front of you, and it's a negative thing how you know distracting your mind from zeroing in on that or focusing in on that so a question i want to um, pose to you is that we know that sometimes distractions can be good or bad uh, what positive distractions could someone consider to avoid focusing on anything negative associated with this COVID 19 which could be leading to a depressive uh feelings or state that someone can be in mm -hmm. I think um, one of the things that I'm struggling with most in a lot of the conversation related to COVID and mental health is, is that word distraction. Because I think we actually need to focus and not look for distractions. Okay. Um, I think now is a time to really pay attention to what's happening because as, as you mentioned with the data, we are in a crisis and you also mentioned, um, you know, this is something that we've never been through before. Mm -hmm. So my concern that people are looking to, you know, 
watch television or play games with family. And those things are great. But um, I think we need to be really thoughtful about taking time to focus on our experience and what's happening because that can kind of turn our attention away from our mental health and how we're really being impacted by what's going on. Mm. And so there's certainly many positive things that we can do. Like I am not at all suggesting that we sit and watch CNN all day, <laughs> all day. Like we don't have to get overwhelmed or consumed by the news, but mm. I do think we need to pause and just, um, you know, uh, be realistic about where we are, about the depressive uh, symptoms, about isolation and what that means. I know Sylvia and Dr. Cooper can tell you when a client comes to us who are depressed, one of the first things we tell them is not like, don't isolate. You know, are you out in the community? Are you doing things that you love and, and you enjoy? So um, the fact that we're isolated, even under the best of circumstances, even for those um, of us who are still employed or, you know, we have food and we're healthy, the fact that we are having to withdraw from community is significant. And so I would just say, instead of looking for ways to um, distract yourself from the realities of what's happening, pause and just be really reflective and introspective around kind of what's happening and how it's impacting me. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Good. Now um, with that, um, and I'll stay right here with you again, Valerie. So, I um, mean, I, I like the way that you say that because we have to be careful that we don't um, ignore the reality that we're in, but there's maybe something we can embrace out of that. Um, how would you describe or just comment on the fact, and this could be for any any of you, um, isolation. I like the word that you use there because I think that's where we are. Um, this, our normal way of life, we've been segregated or segmented from that to a place to where we're now just in our homes with maybe our, only our families or maybe just by ourselves. So if someone is isolated or feeling that, what are some ways that they could build community? Um, to bring them a sense of uh, normalcy to, to where they don't have it anymore. And that can be for anyone. Well, I'll, I'll just add in and say, um, and, I, and understanding that we are in different places. Some of us have a whole lot of technology, others don't. But on Easter Sunday, my son put together a Zoom for my family. Mm. Valerie knows that my family is from the New Jersey up in the North very loud family. So can you imagine all of us were on Zoom on Sunday just to celebrate with each other. Mm -hmm. So sometimes just taking the time to reach out, see other people's faces will help you to not isolate, mm -hmm. um, will not feel so isolated. Mm -hmm. um, making phone calls to friends that you typically, typically wouldn't make phone calls to. Mm -hmm. Just making it a point to reach out and connect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It may sound easier than what it is, but I'm saying that you have to commit to reaching out more than what um, we do sometimes. And on yeah. the other hand, I have a t-shirt that says, check on your strong friend. Mm. We have to reach out and check on some people that we haven't heard from. Yeah, yeah. Just, just to keep people in mind and let people know that I'm here. Okay, okay. Dr. Poop, do you have anything to add with that as far as building community or um, uh, anything that someone can do given this current? Yes. I, I think depression, as we talked about it earlier, it's about going internal. It's taking, uh, sometimes even it's, it's anger turned inward. Hmm. And there's a real sense of uh, becoming so introspective to the point that you, uh, you live in a fog. Mm -hmm. And so it's incredibly important to be reaching out to people to keep perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening with you? How are you dealing with it? In fact, every day I try to think of a couple of people that I can call today or text just to be a ministry to them. Mm -hmm. Because when I do that, it's amazing. The response is like, man, thank you for thinking of me. I'm so glad you got in touch with me. You walk away knowing that you brought life to their darkness. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that I think is very important about the fact that we have an opportunity in the midst of what we're doing to become light for people's darkness, to help them to keep their perspective, to help them see 
that they're not in it alone. And I think if every day I would have a couple of people that I intentionally say, I'm either going to, I'll even uh, text them and say, you, you okay for a Zoom call right now? And uh, they'll come on and I say, just wanted to say, this will take two minutes. Can I pray for you? In other words, it's kind of a thing where just letting them know that uh, out of sight isn't out of mind. Yeah. And so uh, that, I think what Sylvia said, and I think what Valerie said, it's just building on top of what we're talking about. The community is, you know, we can be together and be alone. Mm. So I think it's the kind of the deal where mm-hmm. it's interchange. It's, it's, it's letting you know I'm interested in you. And uh, that's what builds community. And so it's keeping that relationship alive that way. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. That, I, I really appreciate that. Okay. So I just want to oh, yeah. say Go ahead. what Dr. Cooper said, as far as just like randomly picking up the phone and making that outreach is the anonymous kind of spontaneous calls that mean a lot for me. Mm-hmm. Um, as a broader culture, we are so used to structure and schedules that now even those scheduled Zoom calls for community just feel so over-engineered. <laughs> so they start to feel like, you know, another meeting that I have. Right, right, right. If I'm out and about, I might randomly run into someone. Or if I'm used mm-hmm. to in an office, I might just randomly walk past my, you know, colleague's desk to interact. So I really appreciate what Dr. Cooper said as far as just picking up the phone and cold, cold calling. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Dr. Cooper, I have a um, question for you. Um, if you are the friend or family member of somebody that is dealing with um, some mental health challenges right now, um, how can you support them right now? I think one of the key things is to let them know that right now where they are is where they should be. Okay. In other words, it's not like you shouldn't be here. It's you're here. Mm-hmm. This is what you're dealing with. This is what you're feeling. It's not about being normal or abnormal. It just is. Mm-hmm. And so it's giving them permission to be there. Mm-hmm. I think what happens is that there's this sense of expectation that we're not supposed to be in this place. And I'm stepping back saying, okay, is that working for you? Mm-hmm. Because <laughs> it's you're here. You're not going to yeah. just leave it. So accept it, first of all and befriend it saying, okay, this is where I'm at. Now, remind them that they're not there alone. Mm. I'm with you, Mm. that uh, I'm here as a safe place for you. You can talk about it. If you're angry, that's fine. If you're having a difficult time, that's fine. Let's put it in the context of what it's about. It's called grief. Mm -hmm. We've lost something. We no longer had the freedom we used to have. We no longer have that sense of being able just to go out and do something or drive around in the car or whatever. We are asked to stay home and shelter ourselves. So we've lost something. Mm -hmm. And even though it's a good thing we're doing, it's still a loss. Mm -hmm. And so we can't help but be depressed or fearful of the future. What's this going to mean down the road? Most people rarely live in the moment. I find we go to the future with our fear, and then we bring the future back with us and live as if it's going to happen. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, or we go to the past and say, man, if I had just prepared better for this. So let me get this straight. Part of your five-year plan was being in a pandemic. Is that right? <laughs> so <laughs> so what, what we need to recognize is that Going to the future isn't going to help us with this. And going to the past, being worried about this, it's what can I do right now that helps me in this moment to be able to embrace where I'm at and to make the best of it? Because this is all I got. Mm -hmm. And as Jesus said, you know, tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Yeah. So, so, so let's deal with what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do in the next hour, in the next 10 minutes, in the next, you know, instead of seize the day, it's seize the moment. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, I can help my friends who are dealing with these kinds of things by keeping them in the present, by keeping them in the moment, Mm -hmm. by helping them not to run out in the future and bring it back and now live in fear that, it's a fact when it's not, we didn't envision this future. Why would we envision that's going to be our future? Yeah. So let's grab on what we can control. And that's what we have for the next five minutes, 10 minutes, next hour, 
next day. In fact, frankly, I really think that's how God intended us to live is that, you know, just taking one day at a time. Yeah. So in some ways it's helping me to live in the moment. So that's how I help my friends keep perspective in saying, okay, are, are, are did you eat today? Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Yeah. Hey, that's a blessing. Yeah. So it's helping people to embrace the smaller things that they do have. Mm -hmm. So don't, as I say, don't focus on what's lost, focus on what's left. So mm -hmm. what's left? What have you got? Well, you got a place to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got a TV to look at. You got food to eat. You got people you can call. So let's start numbering those off. So focus on what's left, not what's lost. Oh. Mm -hmm. And that's where I try to help folks stay. Well, that, that's interesting. And um, so a question that came to mind as you were um, talking, and I like how you worded that, um, uh, how sometimes we'll go to the future, <laughs> and the here and now. Would you say that one reason why many people slip into some form of a depressive state is because of the fear of the unknown? Like, can we say fear is a driver or has yes. is some level of an ingredient for um, mental health issues? I really do. I think fear is, is a key piece. Fear, I'm going to not ever get out of this. Hmm. Fear in the sense that I thought I was in control and I found out the best I can really do is manage. Hmm. So, you know, I, I tell people that you really aren't in control, but you're managing quite well. Hmm. Because every day I go out on the road, let somebody cut in front of me, how much control did I have? Well, I couldn't control them. I have to control, I have to manage my reaction. Mm -hmm. So I think you're absolutely right. It's about fear and it's a fear about losing control. It's a fear of my fantasy or dreams not happening. And there, and it's a fear, and I don't know how else to say this. It's a fear of time. In other words, I've only got so much time. Mm -hmm. And here I am sheltered in this. I'm losing time. Yeah. How can I get to my goals? when I'm losing time like this, I've, I've got things I've got to do. Mm -hmm. And I try to get back to people and say, maybe your assumption about this being your time isn't a correct assumption because it's really not your time. Mm -hmm. It's God's. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if it's God's time, he believes this is the best way you can use your time right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's use it to know God. Yeah. And what he has in mind, mm -hmm. rather than thinking about, I'm not going to reach my goals. Well, yeah. maybe the goal right now is to know the God of the goals. Mm -hmm. And and by doing that, then I can then submit to that. Yeah. I, I hope that makes sense. So it does. Perfect, <laughs> sense. Perfect sense. Well, so with that, um, Sylvia, a question I want to throw at you. Um, We've been talking so far about depression um, or early signs of it. Uh, what could be the root cause? Another term um, that comes up a lot is anxiety. Mm. Um, so what would you identify are the differences, if any, between anxiety or depression? Yeah, um, yeah people ask that question often um, because sometimes they look like twins. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't know whether you're depressed or it's just your anxiety talking to you too loud. And that's how I describe anxiety. Anxiety likes to talk to you, mm -hmm. likes to hang out with you. Um, so one, one of the, the ways I describe anxiety is that you tend to, and, and it's different for everybody. Let's just be clear on that. The way it may manifest in you may be different in how it manifests in me. So mm -hmm. I'm giving generalizations. But when you're struggling or, or dealing with anxiety, you tend to have a nervousness. Sometimes you know where it's coming from. Sometimes you don't know where it's coming from. You find that your heart is beating fast sometimes or that your palms are sweaty or that you got this pain right here. You know, you got all this muscle tension or you just, you're just fretful. You're always hypervigilant. You're you know, and when you have those signs on a consistent basis, very often not able to identify where they're coming from, that's anxiety. Mm. When Dr. Cooper was talking, I was thinking about, I do a, a lot 
with anxiety. And, and I, I work to try to teach my clients that your goal was not to just get rid of it. We got to learn how to manage it. We got to learn how to identify it. Because if you can identify what's going on, you very often can calm it down. This is what happens very often with anxiety, right? So mm-hmm. you feel something, you try to fight it, and it just gets bigger. Mm-hmm. It's like a snowball. And then you're trying to fight it more, and it gets bigger, and sometimes winds up in a full-blown panic attack. Yeah. yeah. So the goal for me working with people is to start to identify what it is. Okay, I know what's going on right now. I need to stop. I need to breathe a little bit take my deep gut breaths and try to calm it down. Yeah, yeah. Whereas depression, which we've talked about already, depression tends to come in the form of, you don't feel like doing anything. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're not hyper, you're just in a slump. Mm-hmm. You know, you just can go to work, you say hi, and then you come back home and you sit on the couch. Mm-hmm. Sometimes mm. you have enough energy to take your clothes off, change your clothes. Sometimes you don't. Mm. Mm. So, but again, sometimes they look like twins because they get all mixed up. Your anxiety could be fueling your depression or your depression could be fueling your anxiety. Mm. Mm. Um, go ahead, Dr. Cooper. I see you. Can I was just going to say, may I add to that? I love what you just said. It was dead on. I, I think for me, I want to add in the piece that don't forget there's a neurochemical aspect that's going on that we live in a culture that lives on adrenaline. Mm. And so each and every day people are basically running to this event, to that event, to the next event. And it's the adrenaline rush that keeps them going. Mm. And so what ends up happening is we get almost addicted to the adrenaline. I think that's why people are having a hard time staying at home yeah. Because bottom line is, okay, what am I going to do? And because the adrenaline is what they're living for, we've gotten kind of hooked on it. Well, when you've had those kind of adrenaline aspects going on, you crash when you have nowhere else to go. So you have this anxiety and then you crash. You have this anxiety and then you crash. And that's part of what people I think are irritable about because they're on this roller coaster ride. And that's what they're feeling. They're feeling this anxiety from not having anywhere to go with this tension that they're used to releasing. Mm -hmm. And so they have this incredible anxiety, and then all of a sudden they crash. They feel terrible because they've had this release. And so it's this up and down thing that keeps going on. So we've created a culture of of, of adrenaline junkies in some ways, and Mm -hmm. it really adds to the anxiety that people feel. Mm. Uh, so I think that fits what Sylvia's talking about big time in this regard. Yeah. I, just, I just want to add though, before we leave talking about anxiety, that anxiety in itself is not always bad. No, 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 I agree. Anxiety I agree. It can be a real motivator for you to Absolutely. get done, right? Absolutely. It's when you have, like Dr. Cooper was saying, those real highs. Mm-hmm. You know, and you can't function because it's so hot at night. That's right. That's when it becomes a problem. But anxiety in and of itself is not yeah. the problem. And That's I tell right. people that sometimes we live in it with anxiety for so long that it becomes our best friend. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right? It becomes yeah. our best friend. And I tell people, tell your friend they can't go to that meeting with you today. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Mm learn how to manage it and not take it with you every time you go somewhere or every phone call you go on. And, um, and it does help when you start to realize what it is and learn how to manage it some. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I'm going to say one more thing real quickly. I, I even tell my, my folks who deal with anxiety or worry, I said, well, from two to four o'clock today, I want you to worry the heck out of everything. I just want you to worry like crazy for two hours. And they're going, well, that sounds crazy. I said, no, let's get it all out at one time. (laughs) (laughs) And just worry like crazy. It's funny. They'll try it. And then they have to laugh at themselves going, what am I doing? And then they realize just how ridiculous it is to constantly be in that state. (laughs) So you really have to accept it 
so that you can deal with it rather than fight it all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so the, um, so uh, Valerie, let me ask you a question. Um, I want to direct towards you because I'm sure that if the average person did a inventory of their own emotional health, that they would probably see signs of either those two depression or anxiety, Mm. or maybe some other, um, uh, mental challenges or concerns. Um, but many people see mental health as a weakness. And, um, I would even say particularly in the black community. Mm -hmm. Um, so what would you say, um, to the people who would probably have those thoughts that, okay, I can't say anything because it's going to, it's going to seem as though I'm giving into the weak part of me and I'm going to mm. overcome it with my own mental strength or anything like that. How would you uh, respond to somebody that had that perspective? Yeah, I think it's a situation where we've, as a culture, we've normalized depression mm-hmm. and, and sadness. So I, I don't even think it's a situation where people are not necessarily comfortable saying that they feel sad or depressed, mm-hmm. but I believe that we're like a culture of, um, we, as a culture, we are a community of people who are about, endurance and suffering. And it's kind of, it's become our right of our rites of passage, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's more so a matter of us walking away from moving away from this kind of narrative that everything is going to be all right. And that kind of, I, sometimes if we're being honest, um, you know, we might minimize other people's struggles or challenges with mental health because their situation looks a little bit different than ours. So they might mm-hmm. have luxuries that that we don't necessarily have and it's mm-hmm. you haven't been through what I've been through mm-hmm. There's a tendency as a culture to kind of measure um to measure one's um challenge or or negative experience mm-hmm. um, I also think that um you know it, and it's not a matter of we feel things differently than people outside of our culture I think again we just become very much accustomed to um, blunting emotions and feelings and stuffing mm-hmm. and not dealing with them. But of course they come up in different ways. Mm-hmm. And so um, and in large part, if we're again, being honest and having conversations around faith, I think our faith and um, reliance on God and spirituality has also made things like mental health or um, sadness, you know, look like weakness. Mm-hmm. Like, your faith is inferior if you haven't learned to master happiness or master reliance on on God. Yeah. 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 And so I, mean, I think, um, you know, not to discourage anyone from faith and, and spirituality, but as conversations like this, the, mm-hmm. the community of um, faith is stepping up and helping people to understand that in addition to praying and relying on God, that there are also numerous other resources when it comes to your kind of holistic well-being. Yeah. So would you um, <clears throat> would you say um, pretty much to somebody that could be struggling in this area that um, if they're struggling with any form of a mental health issue or concern or challenge, that um, there's no reason for them to feel any sort of shame mm. because of it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. And and to be perfectly honest, sometimes that perpetuates depressive feelings. Mm -hmm. Not only Mm -hmm. are you sad and overwhelmed and incapable of controlling those emotions, you feel guilty Mm -hmm. of having those emotions because Black people don't get depressed. (laughs) We're going to be. Um, Or, you know, I'm a person of faith. I shouldn't feel this way. So that only compounds the issue. So. Mm -hmm. So my, my hope and part of kind of my platform and purpose behind what I do is to help normalize kind of mental health issues and normalize yeah. depression. Um, personally, from my own experience, um, I, you know, I, I dealt with depression. And the funny thing is it took years for me to identify that, um, that I was actually depressed because it was something that I observed in different family members that just looked and felt quite natural. You know, it's okay to come home from work and just kind of turn off and, and disconnect because it's mm-hmm. that kind of what I saw in different instances. So, um, you know, we definitely have to be in a place where we're willing to have conversations like this and be more open about how we're feeling and, and our struggles 
and um, yet yeah, not feel not feel any any shame about it. It's just a yeah. part of humanity. Yeah, uh, you just wept, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, good. Um, so, Dr. Cooper, switching gears just slightly. Um, so, okay. we've been talking about us more um, from an adult perspective. Right. However, um, there could be some emotional challenges for children as a result yeah. of this whole COVID-19 um, pandemic. So what would you say are some of the emotional challenges that children could face um, during this pandemic or a pandemic like this? I think, first of all, it's important for us to realize that children at different stages in life process emotion differently. Mm -hmm. And so we have to keep in mind that <clears throat> a lot of kids feel and act out because they don't have the words to put to it. So they don't know how to express what they're feeling. So they don't have the categories like an adult where we have a continuum of where we can go up and down and say, I'm either sad or frustrated or mad or whatever. They, they don't have that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so one of the things we have to keep in mind is that when a child is really feeling afraid or insecure, we're gonna find that they may act out more. They may become more rebellious. They may be, uh, become uh, more isolated themselves and pull away that depending upon their temperament, it's gonna be seen in their behavior and in their actions. So one of the key things though, that's going to come up is a sense of uncertainty, uh, a sense of fearing what's coming next how they react, and I'm going to move ahead a little bit with this, depends upon whether they live in a culture of faith or a culture of fear. Mm. So if they have a family that reacts to everything that happens around them, kind of like, oh, my God, so-and-so got a hangnail. Oh, gee, they did? Oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? Oh, my good, what's going Well, then all they know is that you panic. Yes. when something like that happens. Yes. On the other hand, if there's a sense of, well, you know, uh, we're here, we're together, we're having a meal, uh, let's go play a game. You know, in other words, normalizing it as much as possible to say, you're not alone, you got me, and I'll protect you. Mm -hmm. They need to know they're protected, they're safe, and they need what I call affirmation. And I'm going to give you uh, what I call three types of affirmation. They need words of affirmation. Mm -hmm. You know, I am so proud of the way you're handling this. I am so glad to see that, you know, you are really dealing with this well. And I want you to know that I'm so glad you're my son or daughter and how you're dealing with this. Thank you so much for how you've been dealing with this. Uh, they need words of affirmation. They need physical affirmation. Come here, let me give you a hug. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know that uh, you're not alone. And, you know, isn't it interesting that the biggest sense organ in our bodies, our skin. And mm -hmm. so we need to be touched. Mm -hmm. uh, so those kids need to know they feel safe. They need to be hugged. They need to be touched. They need to have those words of affirmation. And then there's one other thing I call predictive affirmation. Mm -hmm. And that means, you know, when this is over, we're going to go over here and uh, man, we're going to get to play ball again. When we get through this, we're going to get to take that vacation and do those things you've been talking about. When we, so it's predicting that this is going to end. <laughs> this mm -hmm. isn't going to be forever. And it's giving them kind of a vision that there's hope. Yeah. That there's something yeah. to look forward to. Yeah. And so I think for children right now, what they need is what Valerie even said earlier. They need a sense of consistency a sense of stability and a calming presence. Mm -hmm. And then I need to be speaking into their lives, those words of affirmation, giving them that physical touch and that predictive affirmation. So they know that it, this isn't life. This is just a part of it. We have something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the goal is to help them not to suppress their feelings, but to know that they can have other feelings too of hope and something to look forward to as well. And that's, that's where I think you help your kids. If I'm not anxious, they won't be anxious because they take their cues from us. Mm -hmm. And so if we model that for them, kids are way more resilient than they would give them credit for. Mm -hmm. uh, they, can, they can handle it. 
but they can't handle it if you're not handling it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the key. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, they obviously they know more, they know a lot more than we assume. They're hearing mm -hmm. everything. And if you have the news on all day, they're hearing it, they're consuming it. Um, but they're looking to us to interpret that, to assign meaning to what it is that they're hearing. And so I've been encouraging parents to check in and ask the question because sometimes we're making assumptions about how they feel. And so um, spend the time, whether that's because we, for the most part, most of us, we do have some extra time. So whether that's your work or time at the dinner table, ask them specific questions. And um, one of the things that I've been practicing um, with my son and also encouraging clients to ask about what, what they think about what's happening and what, mm -hmm. they, what they think is going to be some type of interpretation of everything that they've been hearing and their understanding. Um, but then that second part is then how do you feel about that? That's good. You know, you know, we can't do, um, uh, we have to do open-ended questions with the kids because we'll get a, a fine, good, you know, almost yeah. fine. <laughs> giving them the space to talk about it so that we're not making assumptions about how they feel and that we're not overgeneralizing how they feel. Mm -hmm. And also, um, to, I, a thousand percent agree with Dr. Cooper in terms of, um, you know, helping them to understand that there is um, a, a brighter experience on the other side of this. At the same time, I think as parents, we have to be careful not to glamorize what's happening either or minimize the fact that, like, as we talked about at the start of the conversation that, you know, this is a crisis. And so not that you want to use that language specifically with a small child, but there is a certain level of unpredictability about what's happening and instability. And these are times when, you know, under the right circumstances, you can help to build character where you yeah. can help to you know, be able to demonstrate for them what faith looks like, or what mm -hmm. mental health, um, what, what good mental health looks like. So have that dialogue, check in, you know, modify the conversation based on the age of your child, but don't, don't make assumptions about how they're feeling and be honest mm -hmm. with how mm -hmm. much you know, because don't, mm -hmm. tell them, you know, three weeks from now, we're all going to be on the playground again or in the move at the movies. If, if in fact, we might not see that happen until the fall. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good. Well, um, so outside the topic of um, children, Sylvia, a question I wanted to ask you. Um, some people have struggled with alcohol, drug addiction, maybe prior to this, and maybe they got through it and conquered that and landed in a um, good, healthy place of so sobriety. Um, what are some ways that someone can avoid slipping back into those old habits or old behaviors? So to say avoid is kind of holistic. <laughs> and Valerie's smiling because we know that people relapse all the time. Even people who've been clean and sober for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So what I say is first know that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not alone. Talk to people. If you feel yourself struggling or you're feeling um, old feelings coming up, because I have some clients who are struggling, going through this right now. Um, write about all the good things that's happened since you've been clean. Remind yourself. Mm -hmm. Go back and look at um, where you've come. The benefits of being clean. The benefits of being sober. You know. Um, and the good news is that there are online um, groups going on. Okay. So, even though you may not have been in a group for 15, 20 years, it may help to get in a group. Mm -hmm. Just to just talk about remembering when you were at month one or remembering when you were at year one um, and reach out. You, you don't have to do it alone. And I encourage people to try not to do it alone and be kind to yourself, you know, because you are having thoughts and because you were feel like you might be struggling doesn't mean that you're weak it means that you're human yeah and yeah. this is a trying time that we all are in mm. so i may not have struggled with alcohol but i may have struggled with something else and i'm like this is a hard period for us to be in so i, I just encourage people to be kind to yourself and if you don't get to talk to someone or visit with a group start journaling yeah. And 
-hmm. write about what you're going through and what you're feeling and just help out there. Mm -hmm. um, besides the three of us, there, <laughs> there's so much help out there for people to, to talk to, have someone mm -hmm. to talk to. Tell your family that you're struggling. Yeah. yeah. And if one comes to you and say that they're struggling, Valerie talked about the stigma that's in our community, embrace them. Mm -hmm. When Dr. Cooper was talking about the affirmations, I wanted to say, and those same three go for adults. Mm -hmm. we, we, we need to be affirmed. Mm -hmm. Even if we say we don't, we don't, we need to be affirmed. And yeah. so if someone comes to you and say, you know what, I haven't had a drink, I haven't done whatever, but I'm struggling, affirm them, mm -hmm. help them do it, talk to them, you can do this. Mm -hmm. Good, that's good. Now, um, um, Dr. Cooper and Valerie, I have one more question for each uh, of you. And uh, Dr. Cooper will start um, with a question I really would like to hear um, a response from you on. Um, so there have been people I know personally who have lost a loved one, um, maybe as a result of the coronavirus, right. or right. maybe just their time came to where, you know, God called them from this earth. Mm -hmm. So they're dealing with that emotion or that hurt or that pain, in addition to everything else in the society that's going on right now. Um, so how do you get through the grief, loss of a loved one or a job loss or something like that while dealing with everything else that's going on at the same time? That's, I think it's important to keep in mind what you just mentioned is that everything coming at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it can be extremely overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And it's important to step back and recognize that we're dealing with different levels of loss. Mm -hmm. uh, one is permanent. Mm -hmm. That's the loss of a loved one or someone that's, that's gone on or a friend. Uh, the other one is a job loss that's temporary, hopefully. And that in the meantime, we hope that we can, that's something we can remedy, we hope, down the road. But when you put it all together, it's extremely overwhelming. It seems just huge. And so you have to break it down into each of these losses. And the one that's the most difficult to deal with is the loss of that loved one or so forth, because you know that's not coming back. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I tell people is that you have to grieve when you're ready. And that sometimes in order to survive, living in denial is not a bad thing. You sometimes have to put it on the shelf and wait until you can get through some things so that you can actually grieve what's going on. Because to try to stop and grieve right now might shut everything down. Mm. And so what I say is that you've got the stages of grief, shock, and then denial. Well, there's the reason for denial. It's because... If I'm not in some sort of denial, I cannot, uh, I can't put on my clothes today and go out and work. I can't take care of the kids. I can't do that and still grieve over this loss over here because that debilitates me. That takes me to a place where I'm not useful for anyone. So it's important at this time for people to realize it's okay to compartmentalize. It's okay to detach from it so you can get through this, but you will need to come back to it so that you can start to grieve through the process in a way that allows you to feel it and not have to do something to stop it. Yeah. Because what you're doing right now is you want to grieve, but you can't. You want to grieve, but you can't. And so you feel guilty because you're not really feeling the grief. Well, you can't feel it right now. You got too many other things you got to take care of. So at this point in time, allow denial to work in your favor because you're not going to be able to do anything if you're not. I mean, every day, what if we got up and said, you know what, I'm going to die. I know I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I know I'm going to die. How good are we going to be throughout the day if that's all we think about? Hmm. We all live in denial every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we can get through the day. So mm -hmm. if we're doing that, when it comes to just living life, denying certain things so we can live, grief right now is going to be one of the things we have to say, we got to put that on the shelf. And I'll take it off when I can actually breathe, when I can actually deal with it, when I can actually work it through. Mm -hmm. But not to right now try to do it all at once. 
Start with the urgent so you can survive and then come back to that which you can now take the time to work through once it be a longer term. I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. So Valerie, um, question for you, then I'm going to ask each of you a question that I want you, or the same question that i like for you all to respond to. Uh, but before we get to that, Valerie, um, tell me this. So parents, parents are struggling right now for a lot of different reasons. Now, uh, most parents like myself, we have picked up a new profession um, as homeschool teachers. And, <laughs> and so if you want to talk about anxiety, oh, let's, man. I, trying to learn new math, I didn't realize how, how complicated that would be. Um, but there are a lot of struggles that uh, parents are going through through a pandemic like this. What words of advice, encouragement would you give to parents just on ways that they can overcome and see themselves through this? Yeah, so I think it goes back to self-care. We talked a little bit about that. So again, and modeling, I think Dr. Cooper touched on that as well. Your kids are going to take cues from your experience and how you're reacting. Mm -hmm. so making sure it's that, you know, old um, adage that we hear all the time. If you're on an airplane and it's going down, put your mask on first before you assist anyone else. And so definitely in this situation, make sure that, you know, emotionally you are well, you're doing the things that you need to tend to your concerns. Um, you have the right schedules and habits and routines in place um, so that again, you're being that model of what good health looks like to, um, to your child in this experience. And then going back to what I mentioned before, just making sure that you are checking in with the kids, even if they look like they're having a good time playing mm -hmm. the game, you know, more yeah. than, um, than, than they're used to. Um, there, there are things that they're thinking about, there are feelings that they're feeling, and you don't necessarily know how to articulate those feelings. One tool that I'll mention, um, and I'll be mindful of time, is um, an emotional wheel. And it, many therapists use that in, um, in session. And literally, if, if parents go out and Google emotional wheel, you'll get uh, different variations of like a massive wheel with probably 50 or so different emotions. And it kind of breaks through those primary emotions, which are the ones that are you know pretty universal. They're easy for us to get to, sadness, anger, joy. But then it goes a click deeper into those uh, secondary emotions, the ones that are not always easy to identify. To articulate. And so I would encourage everyone to do, just do a Google search for emotional will and use that in having conversations with your children. I mean, use it in having conversations with adults as yeah. well. It's just such a good tool for you, uh, for you to tap into to be able to define and assign kind of what it is that you're feeling and experiencing so you can just have um, more kind of comprehensive, productive conversation around how you're feeling. So you're not just getting a simple, okay, I'm okay, I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that would be um, my guidance again, check in. And uh, now, now that we have some time to do things like that, to focus mm -hmm. on emotions and other mental health tools and things along those lines, so. Excellent, excellent. Okay, listen, we have um, uh, two minutes left, so I'll give you all 30 seconds to answer just, just one question. Um, what does faith look like now? Um, so Sylvia, we'll start with you. I want to say that faith looks like it should have looked beforehand. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> for me, even though sometimes we might experience a crisis of faith, which means that the pain is so bad that and so deep that we may question, but faith shouldn't be something that you put on the shelf and then you just leave it there when things are bad and pull it down mm -hmm. when things are good. Mm -hmm. So many of, many of you might know the story of when Martha's debating with Jesus about you should have been here to save Martha mm -hmm. from Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Jesus told her, did I not tell you if you believe you will see the glory of God? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for me, the question is, what does that glory look like? What is going to look like on the other side of this? Mm. Um, I would venture to say this right here is a part of that. Mm -hmm. This session, just being able to go from a faith perspective to talk about mental health mm -hmm. might be a part of that glory on the other side. Mm -hmm. And so we got to know that it won't always look the way we want it to look or what we, yeah. we expect it to look. But keep your faith. Mm -hmm. Keep your faith. 
to know that things will go up sometimes and things will go down, but don't use your faith as a tool for things being good, a barometer to measure whether things are good or whether things are bad. Mm -hmm. Amen. Valerie, what does faith look like now? Yeah, similar to what Sylvia said, faith hasn't changed. The principles of faith have not changed. We, we do. And our circumstances change and our circumstances influence our perspective on faith and who God is all the time, time and time again. And so one of the things I'm challenging myself with through, through this crisis and just other kind of hardships and experiences is that I have to be consistent mm -hmm. and I have to be steadfast and God will be who he is. And so um, I have learned to value these experiences as hard and difficult as they are, because they are hard and difficult, but I've learned to value them because I know it's an opportunity um, for God to call me closer to him. Because he's like, I've been here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, faith has, has not changed. Just, you know, everyone should use this as an opportunity to, um, you know, be clear about what faith means to them. Yeah, amen. Dr. Cooper, what does faith look like now? Um, let me, uh, let me put it this way. I think true faith sees reality through God's eyes. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to faith, how is God looking at this? Because I want to look at it like he does. Mm -hmm. And so it's not taking him by surprise. So why should I be surprised by it? Mm -hmm. He's got control of it so I can feel safe. Mm -hmm. He's the one that basically knows when this is going to end, so I can trust his timing. Mm -hmm. Faith is going back to looking at what I'm looking at through how God would look at it, and that gives me security. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like Jesus. I'm in the boat, and, and there's all kinds of waves going around, but I can sleep mm -hmm. because I know who's in charge of the storm. Mm -hmm. That's faith. Amen. 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 Listen, well said. Thank you all for um, uh, doing this for all of us, and I, including mm -hmm. myself, because I'm, I'm even someone that's listening intently um, for your responses here. And I'm sure that those who are tuned in via Facebook Live or will watch this on playback um, are grateful for you all taking the time to um, go through these and answer these questions for each and every one of this, each and every one of us. But before we leave, um, Tell us how, if someone wanted to get in contact with you for any way, shape, or form, what's the best way for them to reach you? So let's start with you, Valerie. Yep. So I am at ValerieMillerWilliams.com, ValerieMillerWilliams.com. And you can find information on my background, contact information, as well as scheduling um, an appointment if you're interested. Amen. Dr. Cooper. If you want to get a hold of me, you can email me mm -hmm. at Rodney L. Cooper at carolina.rr.com. That's the best way to get a hold of me. Amen. Uh, Sylvia. I'm at sylviajessup.com. Everything you want and need to know is at sylviajessup.com. Amen. All right. Listen, thank you all again. I, I can't thank you enough. If if I could give you all a hug, I, I would, but we're social distancing <laughs> right now. But maybe when all this clears, I'll, I'll definitely embrace you all because you've been a huge blessing uh, to the kingdom of God. Let me just say that. Amen. Well, thank uh, we, you. Don't, we don't talk enough about mental health, but uh, Sylvia, as you stated, maybe in God's infinite wisdom, uh, this is one of the glory aspects that will come. Mm. Mm. So we'll submit to that. So uh, before we drop, um, let me just say a quick word of prayer for you all and for those listening and for everyone struggling with this pandemic. Amen. Amen. All right. So Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for this time that we've had together just to discuss and share uh, mental health as it relates to our current state of affairs with the COVID-19. Father, I'm praying to Lord for our guests, panelists here today for their uh, practices and their profession in the mental health world. Um, continue to give them grace to operate in the manner that they have, which are helping people through challenging times. I'm praying to Lord for everybody watching here. They're watching for a particular purpose, maybe to educate themselves or maybe because they're dealing with something right now. Whatever the reason is, dear God, we pray that your grace will meet them at the point of their need or at the point of their pain. And Father, we believe that as we all overcome through this, we'll be better, stronger, and wiser, dear Lord. Um, so we lean on you and we trust you. As your word says, some men trust in 
horses, some trust in chariots, mm. but we trust in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So we put our rest and trust and help, hope and faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Everybody have a great night, and we'll see you, you when we Thanks for the free therapy. You are from the clinician. We'll see you. All right. Take care. God bless you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Oh.